you got to find your bounds. Find your bounds by setting those things equal to each other. That's step number one. Yes, no? Okay. Have you already solved it? <coughs> so solve it by subtracting the x. You're going to get the x cubed minus x equals 0. Factor it, of course. You're going to get x times x squared minus 1. Keep going. 0. X plus 1. X minus 1. You get how many points? 1, three. 2, 3, 4. Three. 3. Don't forget about that one. X equals 0. X equals 1. X equals negative one. I think I have those out of order, but those are the three points that you you get. Raise your hand if you're able to find those three points. Feel okay with that? Now, when you set this up, where's our ultimate interval? Where's it start? No, where does it start? Where's it end? Notice how what you did, you found the only three points in the world where these things actually touch, right? You found the only points in the world where they could actually bind bound. Have, have bounded some area together. So negative 1 starts it, 1 ends it, but there's a point in the middle where it could change. Remember the graph I, I gave you at the very beginning of class where the color switched? Mm -hmm. That might be what we have happening right here. So you got to check for that. So it needs to include that point 0. And how many intervals are we actually going to test? Two. two intervals typically means two integrals. Three intervals means three integrals. Four means four. One means one. So this means we're probably going to have an integral here, and we're probably going to have a different integral here with just our functions reversed, depending on which one is on the top and which one is on the bottom. Uh, so for each interval, test a point in both. What point do you want to test over here? And over here, probably one half. If I'm testing negative one half, y equals x cubed, when I plug in that negative one half, it's going to give me negative one eighth. If I test this in the y equals x, it's going to give me, well, this is pretty easy, negative one half. Now, think carefully which one's on the top. This one's actually bigger than that number, right? It's bigger. So this one is on the top, x cubed and x. Do you see how this, this picture shows you what, how to set it up? It's kind of nice. I would encourage you to use that. You don't have to, but without drawing a graph, that's a really nice way to do it. You go, okay, it starts here, ends there. That one's on the top, that one's on the bottom. Do you see why the x cubed is on, is on the top? You plug in any number in here, this one point's going to equal zero. That one's always going to be bigger than that one. Now, the one half. When I plug in one half, this will be one eighth. And this will be one half. Which one's bigger here? X. X. Very good. So X is here. X cubed is there. We're going to do the setup and then we'll end there because I'm pretty sure that you can... You can do this on your own, but stick with me for the setup at least. So let's do our setup, make sure it's right before we go. We're going to have, how, how many integrals do we have? So it's basically like a two part problem here. We're going to have one integral from negative one to zero. That's where it starts and stops. Which Function is coming first here. X to the third. And then what? Then minus x. Very good. Dx. I would typically be putting parentheses around those things, but because they're only single terms each, we can kind of neglect that. We just have x cubed minus the x. Not sure if you're okay with that so far. Okay. What are we going to do now? Are we going to add or subtract? We're combining the two. We're basically wanting to say the area here and the area here, right? I don't want to subtract them. I want to add them. I'm doing two different problems right now. And they have to be done differently because the order changes. Top and bottom change. You have to have twice. So big old plus. Another integral. Where does the integral start? Zero, 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 one. zero to one of what? Uh, X minus 
Now, just because this goes from negative 1 to 0 and this one goes from 0 to 1, you can't combine them because they're not exactly the same function. So you have to do two different integrals. Do this one, do this one, figure out what it is, and then uh, we'll start here. We'll probably start here next time. I'll just start with this integral. I'll give you the answer, and that will be our game. All right, so we're on this problem. Let's finish it up. Uh, we're basically down to the part where we're just evaluating the integrals, which is going to stand for the area. I think the way we did this was we realized that we need to separate any interval into how many segments you have, find out which function is on the top, which function is on the bottom for each interval, and then make up basically one integral per interval. So if you look at last time on the video, or you look at your notes from last time, the way we set this up is we had x cubed on top of x between negative 1 and 0, and then another interval went from 0 to 1, but x was on top of x cubed. So that's where these setups come from, at least for finding area between two curves. Now, as far as accomplishing the integrals, well, let's see if we got them right. So we got x to the fourth over 4 minus x squared over 2. And we'll be evaluating that from z negative 1 to 0. And then we'll have another integral given us x squared over 2 minus x to the fourth over 4 from 0 to 1. Now, unfortunately, I think I said this last time, but I said it as we were leaving. Unfortunately, there's no way to put those together to make one integral out of it, even though the bounds match up. They really do. Negative 1 to 0 and then 0 to 1. Because our functions are not the same, we can't do that. Feel all right with that so far? Okay. So let's go ahead and accomplish this one. And plug in all of these numbers. 0 over 4 minus 0 over 2 minus negative 1 to the 4th over 4 <coughs> minus negative 1 squared over 2 and make sure you have that in parentheses. It's important to have that because that sign is going to change. <coughs> this is basically this first one. That's what that is. Then we're going to add to it a whole other one. We'll plug in our 1. Subtract off our zero. Uh, force it for us, our zero doesn't do anything. But I still want to show it because I don't want to lose it in case it did do something. A substitution sometimes you'll still plug in zero and you'll still have a number after that. How many people made it that far, by the way? On that. Cool deal. Now we'll work through this and try to get some, some proper answers. This is going to give you zero. This gives you one fourth minus one half, and it's in parentheses still. Plus. This gives you one half minus one fourth minus <coughs> zero. Are we still okay so far? All right, very good. What you're going to get out of that, hopefully, you're going to get negative one fourth. Did you get negative one fourth? That's going to change it to positive one fourth. So this segment is one fourth. Plus, this is going to be all together. You have ah, how many people find area one half? Which is kind of cool when you think about it. We're, we're able to find now the area between two curves when one of the curves isn't the x-axis. We talked about that last time, right? Basically, we're doing the same thing, finding the area between two curves where one of them was the x-axis. Now we're saying, what if it's not? What if it's some other curve? It's not that big of a difference. All we have to do is make sure we know where those curves intersect. That sets up each of our integrals, then find out which function is on the top for each of those curves. Raise your hand if you're okay with what we've talked about so far. All right. Now, I want to show you a couple applications and another way to think of this concept. So basically, I'll show you an application, and I'll show you one example that we're going to do two different ways. One way is going to be the way we've done. One way is going to be significantly easier. You ready for it? Yes. Rock on. Let's do this thing. So here's an application. I want you to see this. Do you guys like racing? Like yeah. cars and stuff? Mm -hmm. I love racing cars. Personally, watching it, whatever, I'll race anything. I, I, I love doing that. So anyway, let's talk about racing cars. And to keep it simple, we're going to do this. You pull up next to me at a red light. 
and then the light turns green, and right as it does, because my reflexes are freaking awesome, I gun it, and I'm way ahead of you, because my car is fast and I'm awesome. So naturally, that's going to happen. Unless you drive a motorcycle, you're probably not going to beat me in my car. So let's say we do that. Here's what's going to happen. We're going to compare our time to our velocity. Where do we start? If we're at a dead stop, we're starting at zero. Both of us are starting at zero. And my velocity goes like this. I hit my little peak, right? And then my, I, I switch gears or something, and then I go, that, that's me. This is me. And here's you. OK, that's you. Sorry, but my car is awesome. <laughs> I'm going to win that race every time. Notice that the me, what these things are, this is a function of our velocities according to time. And time zero, we're at a dead stop. Time one, I'm going very fast, and you're not fast yet. <laughs> uh, anyway, I don't know what car you have. I'm just making a joke anyway. But these are our velocities. This is velocity one, or velocity me. And this is velocity you, two. <laughs> And this is the technical term. Sure. My question is, between here where we start and here where the race is over, A or zero, and B where the race is over, do we have any area between the curves? The question is, what does that area actually represent? Clearly I won. <laughs> Clearly I won, because my velocity was quicker than yours. This is not position, by the way. This is not position. What this would be, if you had a position curve, or if you had a velocity curve, you could integrate to find your position. Remember that? Velocity to position, you integrate. Or if you had a position curve, you could actually find the derivative to give you velocity. Make sense? So you get this, and this one might be this, the function of a, a slope of a position curve. That's what this is. So these are velocities. Now, tell me something. We're finding area, right? Area. What's the width? Time. What's the height? What's time times velocity? You ever seen that before? Distance equals rate times time, right? That is an area. Basically, what you're doing in these, think back to what you're actually doing. What you're actually doing here is finding little rectangles, right? And adding them all up. A little rectangle would be a little piece of time times a little piece of velocity. Time times velocity is a distance. So what this area represents is the distance that I beat you. The distance, at the end of this, the distance between my car and your car. Do you get the idea? That's kind of cool. So given two velocity curves, we can figure out not only who won the race, but how much they won the race by. That's neat. You can't do that if you just compare the velocities. Like at the end of the time, say, oh, I was going 120, you were going 105. Well, who won? Well, maybe, probably I won because I'm going faster. How much did I win by? I don't know that. You could say seconds, right? You could say you won by four seconds. Does it say where you were and where I was when I won? No. But this does. This says if I were. If